I would like to talk about computer architecture. From my experience in university, a lot of people have a very negative opinion of computer architecture courses and the topic in general. Comments like, it's not really applicable, why should I care, and it's boring, are fairly commonplace. The fact that the introductory courses in computer architecture are generally considered difficult and often require you to write assembly by hand doesn't really help with the public opinion. I would like to spend a bit of time in this video trying to persuade you that computer architecture is actually quite interesting by talking about a cool concept and show you an example where not keeping computer architecture in mind can hurt you. First things first, the topic I'd like to discuss is actually quite deep and complicated and there is no way that I can get all the intricacies of it in a video this small, but I will try my best at explaining it. The topic I want to get into at the end is called false sharing, but to get to that, we need to cover a whole bunch of things. So let's start with the basics. The CPU is faster than memory. Contemporary CPUs are really fast at doing things, and usually have more than one core to do those things with. As an example, you can buy a CPU for not too much that can run 5 billion cycles in a single second, and can have 8 cores with 16 threads. Well, if you can get one, CPUs and GPUs are effectively made of unobtainium right now, so I don't know. Some hobbyists actually managed to get a CPU to run at 6.6 .6 billion cycles per second, or 6.6 .6 gigahertz, using some liquid nitrogen to cool it, and got Doom Eternal to run at over a thousand frames per second that way. I'm actually going to link that in the description for you to check out the article. Memory, on the other hand, hasn't really kept up with the speed of CPUs, at least not memory that can hold a lot of things. The faster the memory, the more expensive it is, and the less of it you can reliably produce. Just look at your computer, laptop, or even phone. You can have a lot of data storage, a whole terabyte if you want, but it's lower than your RAM. Your RAM, while fast, put side by side with your main storage device, is really slow when compared to the speed of a typical cache memory. However, cache memory is expensive and is fast by design. A typical CPU will have about 8 megabytes of L3 cache, 2 megabytes of L2 cache, and less than 256 kilobytes of L1 cache total. This cache memory is blazing fast, almost fast enough to actually keep up with the CPU perfectly. I just referred to this thing called a cache memory, but didn't actually explain what the hell it is. Well, let's open this can of worms with a quick analogy. The prototypical example of a cache is this. You live in a house and have a pantry in the basement. Being a responsible person, you stock up on common ingredients, and since they can't all fit in your kitchen, you keep a lot of stuff in the pantry downstairs. One day, you decided to make a huge dinner, and as a part of it, you decided to make a salad with walnuts and a pie with walnuts. Since you rarely do anything with walnuts, you keep them in your pantry. When you start making the salad, you go into your pantry and grab the bag of walnuts. Would you put the bag of walnuts back in the pantry as soon as you finished making the salad? No. You would put them aside on the counter and save yourself a trip up the stairs when you start making the pie. This space on the side of the counter is called your cache. And you wouldn't store everything there, as there's only so much space left before you start to hate yourself uh, while cooking because you have nowhere to cook. The same idea applies to CPUs. The cache serves as a convenient storage space with fast access times for things that you may need soon. The caches are designed with the following neat observation in mind. Most of the code and data access patterns exhibit spatial and temporal localities. Spatial locality means that you are likely to access data close to other data that you accessed just now in the near future. And temporal locality means that you're likely to access data that you already accessed recently. I will leave the answer to the question of why code and data access patterns exhibit these properties as an exercise for the viewer, but leave this hint behind. What are the common data units and language constructs in almost all programming languages? Anyways, let's get back on topic. Ignoring all the details of how hardware CPU caches work exactly, you could make a full university course about that alone, we need to discuss a couple properties of them. First, when you write to memory, you actually just write to the cache and the contents of that memory location are updated at a later date. This way, if you need the contents of that memory, you have the most up-to-date information right there, ready to be read. Another thing, caches do not actually load a single byte of data at a time but rather they typically load full blocks of 64 bytes from memory. In other words, for caches, the smallest unit of data transferred, called a cache line, is 64 bytes. Another little bit of terminology that will be useful in discussion is this. When you try to access a memory address and it's in cache, then that's a cache hit. Otherwise, it's a cache miss. Last technical tidbit that I would like to discuss is that in case an address is written to before it's read, all the data for it, it still gets loaded right into the cache first. 
as the data around it may be used soon. Also, keep in mind, this is how a cache operates when there is a single thread of execution going on and you're not dealing with shared memory. Oh, and I did mention L1, L2, and L3 caches before, so I should probably tell you what they are. However, in the interest of time, I won't really go into all the details of them or why they exist. These caches basically form a hierarchy, where L1 is the fastest and L3 is the slowest. However, L1 is the smallest, while L3 is the biggest. As a point of reference, the L3 cache, while being the slowest, is still a lot faster than RAM. But what if you're dealing with shared memory? What then? Then things get a bit more complicated. Remember how I said how much cache capacity a CPU has? Well, that amount is for the whole CPU, and it's split across all the cores. So on an 8-core CPU, there will be 8 L1 caches, 8 L2 caches, and a single L3 cache shared between all the cores. Each single L1 cache is likely to be around 64 kilobytes, each L2 cache is likely to be around a megabyte. Anyways, when you're dealing with a lot of programs running on each CPU core but not needing to share any memory, life is generally good and what I described before works as normal. However, when you start sharing memory between the programs, things get a bit wacky. Let me explain it with an analogy. And as a heads up, this analogy will be a bit strange and contrived as I'll be using it to explain one specific shared memory management strategy. Let's say you are in a cooking show with seven other chefs. However, the setup is a bit different than normal. You have to cook with one of three ingredients, but there's a limited number of those ingredients, and all of them are in a central room. If you grab some of a certain ingredient, you must tell everyone that you went in and took some of that ingredient, but you do not need to tell how much of that ingredient you took. If you don't need all the ingredients you took, you can put some back, but you must announce that you put it back as well. For example, there are 10 eggs, four beefsteaks, and a kilogram of tofu in that room you decide that you will wow the judges with some sunny side up eggs. You enter the room, grab the eggs, come out and scream that you just took some eggs. On hearing that, one chef runs in just to see how many are left and comes out screaming that they have taken some eggs. Now, you no longer have any idea how many eggs are there left in the room. There could be even none. Next, another chef walks in and screams that they have taken some steaks. But since you don't care about steaks, you don't pay attention. The chef that just took out some eggs goes back into the room and comes out saying that they put some eggs back. Since they're your friend, you go up to them and ask them how many eggs are left in the room, and they respond with five eggs. Now, you did not enter back into the room, but you do know how many eggs are left in the room, and nobody else but the two of you know how many eggs are left exactly. This concludes the analogy. While this may have been a slightly strange and unnatural analogy, it is one that describes how caches work in a shared memory environment decently well. Uh, well, it describes one of the ways that it can work. There are uh, some different shared memory cache management protocols that you can learn about. Anyway, let's describe the protocol with slightly more proper terminology and in the right context this time. From the analogy, each ingredient can be mapped to an address. The number of things left in the room is the information stored at that address, and the chefs are the CPU cores. When the first core tries to access the shared memory location, it broadcasts a message to all the other cores saying that it loaded some information from memory at a specific address. Now, in case some other core wants to read the contents of that address, they can actually ask you for the most up-to-date data at that address. When one core ends up writing a bit of data to that address, it sends out a broadcast to all the other cores telling them to invalidate their local copies of that data, as it's no longer valid. Since the data change may not be useful to all, and it would take time to transmit the data to everyone, the data is not included in that broadcast. This data can take a while to be written, so the request to load that data from memory can take a long time afterwards, depending on the implementation of the CPU. The name of this topic is called cache coherence, in case you want to look it up further on your own. And uh, those that actually know cache coherence protocols, I didn't describe any specific one, just whatever was in my mind that is relatively consistent. I left out a whole bunch of details other protocols and even optimizations on top of what I already described, but this amount of information is actually enough to finally get into the topic that I wanted to actually discuss from the beginning, false sharing. False sharing occurs because the shared memory is not actually truly shared between the caches of each core. I did mention that each core has its own separate L1 cache. False sharing is actually a side effect of the cache coherence protocols, in particular when there are a lot of writes to the same shared memory location. Think about it. Each time a write occurs, the data has to be invalidated on all the other cores. And all the cores might have to wait first for the data to be written out to memory, and then wait to read that data back from memory. Now, time to blow some minds. 
Remember how the smallest unit of discussion for caches or cache lines are 64 bytes? Well, a write to one part of that cache line will invalidate the entire cache line. In other words, you can get false sharing to occur when you're writing to different addresses that are close enough to each other. In other words, you can slow down other cores, sometimes significantly, by writing to memory addresses that those cores don't even care about. Personally, the complexity of the system and the unexpected problems that arise from the complexity of the system are really cool in my opinion. Anyways, right about now, a couple of thoughts could be going through your head. First could be, okay, I've heard enough, this is cool as hell. I will go and take as many computer architecture courses as my university offers and then I'll make a YouTube video about it in my future. <laughs> Too meta for me. The second possible thought is, all right, this problem seems interesting, but why does it actually matter? Third possible thought is, mm, all right, I mean, not like I'll ever need to worry about this at work or in school. The fourth possible thought is, what is going on? Screw this, this is too complicated. I'd rather watch an ML model train for the next three hours and keep thinking about this. And last possible thought is, how does this get recommended to me again? Well, to the people in group one, power to you, man. Happy to show you a fun topic. For people in groups two and three, stick around and see how this actually could affect you at some point in the future. For people in group four, Hey, this is not necessarily for everyone, but consider sticking around because I am about to present some pretty graphs and, well, if you like machine learning, you probably like pretty graphs. For people in group 5, YouTube's recommendation system is a black box that even Google's engineers don't really understand how this got into your feed. Well, with that out of the way, let's motivate this bit of theory with a practical example. Let's say that one day your boss comes up to you and says, hey, set each element in this array to zero and give me back the number of elements that were odd. Just make sure that this runs in under a second, please. Before you get upset that this is too specific and isn't really a realistic task, I will actually give some examples of realistic scenarios where this code could have been implemented after I go through the entire example. For the sake of the example, let's assume that the input array is eight gigabytes in size. Again, lower your pitchforks. Having two billion integers in an array sounds like it's too big to be reasonable, but it does happen. I also need some way to make this linear scan take some measurable time because I do need valid results to present to you. Either way, this task is kind of simple. So you implement it as a, in a single threaded program, like so. You then run the program and measure your performance. And oh God, this took nine and a half seconds to run. This won't do. You need to make this run at least nine times faster so that the task is actually completed. Ah, you know what to do. You remember your operating systems class and think to yourself, I'll use threads to make this run faster. And believe me, this problem is really easy to parallelize, so you implement all the infrastructure in, uh, for threading in no time. Well, since you remember from the OS class that the synchronization can be expensive, you decided to go with the following design that avoids locks and mutexes entirely. You have an array in shared memory with as many elements as there are threads. Each thread just writes the number of odd elements into it using its thread ID as the index. In the end, when sending the results back, you need to simply sum up each thread's contribution of the count of odd numbers. Here's the code of what you implemented. This was actually my first implementation idea. No need to pre-compute certain end indices, just start iterating. Premature optimization is always a bad idea, but this should be nice and fast. However, the speed up just isn't there. In the best case, with eight threads, it still runs in 4.4 seconds. That's weird. This looks like a perfectly parallelizable task. Why is the speed up graph so ugly? Just look at it. This makes next to no sense. Where's my promised linear or almost linear speed up? Fine. Maybe the premature optimization was a bad idea. Let's start over and compute the start and end indices. Here's how I did it. Actually, quick comment on this code. You should probably avoid ternary operators. Uh, they can make code much less readable and you can make silly mistakes with them. Moving on. This ought to be better, right? Well, it is. But the speed up graph is still pretty bad, with the best performance achieved with eight threads, and it still takes 3.8 seconds. It is usually at this point that you and I start blaming the compiler, the all the tool chain, and whatever threading framework that you're using. But then you realize that the num odd array takes only 64 bytes of memory at 16 threads, which means that it can perfectly fit in a single cache line. Therefore, this could lead to false sharing and other fun cache coherence issues. So you decide that the next design should just write the number of odd entries encountered into a local variable, and then write the result to num odd array at the very end. 
but you're still into doing premature optimization, so you go with a simpler indexing approach. You run the performance tests again, and finally you get some good looking speed up graphs. Just look at how much of a performance difference this made in terms of speed up, just by changing three lines of code from your initial approach. The best time was achieved with four threads and it ran in 0.9 seconds. Oh hey, that's actually fast enough for the boss, so we can stop here, but you should, as there is still performance left on the table. Just look at the memory access pattern from the data array. This is not optimal because you're interleaving the memory access in such a way that if all threads are running close to each other, you can have some false sharing. Let's look at the worst case example. Each thread starts execution at the exact same time and thread zero writes a zero to data zero, which invalidates the cache entry in all the other cores. Then thread one writes a zero to data one, which again invalidates everyone's cache entry. This cycle continues and you do, don't have as good of a performance until some threads diverge due to OS scheduling it or other reasons. Actually, in the experiment, I tried forcing this exact scenario by using thread barriers. Anyways, let's fix this with this design. Add back the start and end index calculations. And this fixes the memory access pattern that led to the potential for false sharing. Did that lead to further performance improvements? In this case, yes. Not significant performance improvements, but performance improvements nonetheless. The best speed up was again achieved at four threads and the total runtime took about 0.7 seconds. In order for you to really appreciate how much of a difference this makes, I made a chart that overlays all the speed up curves on one chart and a column chart that shows the difference in runtimes of each implementation and the baseline sequential implementation. Feel free to pause to view them, but in the interest of time, I will move on. I actually first hit false sharing when trying to implement a parallel sorting algorithm and kept blaming my K-Way merge for causing significant performance degradation, down to the overall parallel performance being worse than sequential sorting of the entire list. That didn't make any sense and I kept telling myself there's no way that this could be due to false sharing because I was never writing to any shared memory location. Well, I was actually writing to shared memory a lot in the K-Way merge. And once I did the three line difference, similar to how I did in the toy example, I could almost linear speed up with the number of cores for the overall problem, actually at 13 times speed up over the previous version of the code. Anyways, I did promise to you that I will give some examples of where this task could be useful in the real world. Well, just abstract away the data being collected and the fact that the underlying array was just an array of integers. This task could have been a simple linear scan across data records trying to record the number of occurrences of a specific property. This can happen anywhere and you do not need such huge data sets either. After all, when performance matters, you're likely looking at millisecond or even microsecond scale time budgets. False sharing can be a significant issue, especially at such small time scales. However, just like you shouldn't think that you're more likely to be struck by lightning after someone in your country got struck by one, you shouldn't panic and check all your code for false sharing every single time. It's a relatively rare issue. And by Occam's razor, you should really look at all the other more common performance issues like writing an algorithm with an unnecessarily high runtime complexity before you look for false sharing. But I do think that false sharing is a really cool example of why you should learn about computer architecture. Such strange but cool as hell issues come up all the time when studying computer architecture. And being aware of how a CPU operates is actually a very important part of writing good code that will perform well. Either way, this video is super long already and I shouldn't make it longer by fawning over computer architecture. All I hope is that it motivated you to reconsider your version to computer architecture, and maybe even take that class on advanced computer architecture as a cool elective. Bye.